Welcome to session four, Diaspora as Diversity, the Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Framework. My name is Dr. Liesl Riddle, a diaspora researcher from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. And I'm honored to be the moderator for today's important session. Core to the SDGs is a commitment to diversity and inclusion. Diaspora communities op occupy a unique position in the global quest for diversity and inclusion. The multiple senses of belonging that often characterize the diaspora experience is at the very core of how diasporans can contribute to global understanding and progress on diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the 21st century and beyond. This session will explore some of the early innovators and change makers in diversity, inclusion, and belonging efforts locally, globally, and transnationally. First, we begin learning from the host government for today's session, the government of Mexico. Mr. Luis Gutierrez Reyes is the director of the Institute of Mexicans Abroad and a great promoter of social transformation and social justice. An engineer and computer scientist by training, Mr. Gutierrez Reyes has more than 30 years of experience in the design and implementation of projects and strategies that use technology as a transversal tool to improve decision-making in a collective and efficient way. He's applied his technological expertise to promote ethics, public integrity, prevent conflicts of interest, and combat corruption across several public and private sector organizations. The representative from the government of Mexico has the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us here. I, I have a presentation. I'm going to share the screen. Please come in. Okay. So we have the presentation. This presentation in English, but I, I will explain in Spanish. So I, I think that right now it's working the, the translation. Yes, okay. Muy buenas días a todas y todos. Gracias. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having with us in this diaspora summit. We will be presenting the work of the uh, Mexican Institute, the Institute of Mexicans Abroad. This institute is in the Chancellery of uh, Mexicans Abroad. I would like to share with you our work when it comes to uh, global attention to Mexican communities abroad. Next slide, if you please. Where are Mexicans in the world? We have 12 millions of Mexicans who emigrated all around the world, most of them for several regions, but 97% uh, emigrated to the US. And for those Mexicans in the US, six millions of them are undocumented. We also know that 38 millions of Mexican origin uh, live in the US. We are working with this population of 6 million undocumented by developing uh, policies for uh, helping them. And we work with all those millions of dreamers, uh, those children who emigrated with their parents and uh, they don't have a, a documented status in the, in the in the country. We also have many indigenous people uh, who migrated to, to the US. So we're talking about a full, a full population, a full uh, indigenous people who talk um, uh, 
the indigenous languages of uh, Mexico and those languages will be lost in the US. And so the Mexican government is working in order to preserve uh, this cultural asset. We also have uh, a quite important population in different uh, sexual orientation. And we also identified over a million people highly qualified who re re reside abroad, mainly in the US, as I said. This is the Mexican talent who emigrated and are working in different countries. Next slide, please. I would like to briefly say that through the consulate networks of Mexico all around the world, and especially in the US, we work in three ways. First, protection. We pay attention to vulnerabilities and assisting in crisis, situ crisis situations. Then we work on documentation, uh, on issuance of identity and nationality documents. And then the community work of global IME. We seek networks of leaders, associations, civil society organizations, and government agencies. These are web of networks. In 2022, we focus on global attention to Mexican communities in free access. First of all, binational and international strategic engagement. We want to create a web of networks to strengthen and represent and defend the Mexican migrant community worldwide. Secondly, a full representation of the community abroad. We seek to recognize its importance with new models of political organizations taking into account the diversity of the Mexican population according to their regions and social demographic profiles. And thirdly, we seek to empower communities. We want to accelerate program and place more emphasis on providing communities the tools to defend their interest. What does IME do? The Institute of Mexican Abroad is an agency within the uh, Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs created on April 23 that we should promote the recognition of migration phenomena and the dignified treatment of Mexicans abroad, encourage the establishment of dialogue mechanism and promote communication with and between Mexican communities uh, living abroad, establish coordination with governments, institutions and organizations of states and municipalities regarding prevention, attention and support to Mex for Mexican uh, communities. And we seek to to collect and systematize proposals and recommendations to improve the quality of life of Mexican communities abroad. How are we present in the Mexican consulate? We created uh, uh, some assistance for educative orientation. It focused on health, education, uh, finance. We help uh, um, indigenous people, uh, sports, and um, cultural and civic uh, engagement. How do these community resource centers or windows operate? We have a central government. Uh, um, uh, and for instance, for the health window, the um, health um, ministry, uh, provides us with some millions of dollars uh, uh, to be distributed uh, through the consulates, and every consulate will seek uh, an um, alliance and an allies in order to provide uh, different services uh, to migrants. And we wanted to um, provide these health uh, uh, services to migrants. What are our health activities? Uh, we have currently 51 health resource centers or windows in this uh, uh, council network. Um, and we need to say that uh, the Mexican consulate network in the US is the biggest consulate network in the US. We all we started an health and psycho-emotional psycho support. Um, uh, for instance, when it comes to mental health, uh, this um, uh, during COVID, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, we cooperated with many health authorities and we provide uh, health support, uh, mental health support. Also, due to pandemic, we developed some strategies 
for uh, for m mental health uh, through uh, some universities in Mexico in order to broaden the, the uh, specialist networks in order to detect uh, uh, mental health issues uh, in the consulates um, for those migrants who approach the consulates. And we have uh, some psychologist networks uh, uh, the university who provides services to those people in order to um, work in early prevention. And we provide services, especially to female Mexican and students uh, during the quarantine periods and during all the pandemic period at the end of the day. But what about education? We establish a very um, important projects. These are grants for uh, young people. We also have a, a network in the in the US um, in order to approach uh, those uh, youngsters who migrated to the US. And we created a consortium for, of higher education instit um, institution for academic development of Mexicans abroad. Uh, financial inclusion and economic development. We are helping migrants with their finances and we provide services such as migrant banking, uh, social securities and so on. You can see the list. We are currently developing a consular entrepreneurship program for Mexican women abroad with the Arizona University. Uh, this is the second edition, and it was developed uh, 26 Mexican representation edition in the US and one in Europe. When it comes to civic participation strategy, we are working on a strategy for ID in order so that people abroad can vote. We are creating in spaces in Mexico where they can be represented at the federal and local level. And we also seek to work in a binational leadership of the Mexican community abroad uh, with dual citizenship and fluency in the language of the country of residence. One of those strategy in order to seek this link with the community abroad uh, well, the Red Global MX is the network, talent network. It has 71 chapters distributed in 35 countries, uh, 6,000 members, and we seek to gather all the uh, emigrated Mexican talent. Uh, we want to keep the link with Mexico through um, digital platforms. Um, we work on culture and engagement. We have uh, some... Um, um, networking sessions with dreamers in the US and in Canada. Uh, those dreamers came uh, a summer uh, to Mexico. They shared their time with indigenous people and with artists. We uh, also provide us, uh, um, well, uh, we created the Distinguished Mexican Award. Uh, uh, when it comes to culture, we had some uh, cinema uh, sessions uh, um, in order to promote um, um, indigenous languages. And now we are created an indigenous migrant forum in order to defend their um, indigenous migrant rights. When it comes to gender equality and inclusion, we are creating a a uh, network of Mexican LGBT and uh, plus a committee uh, abroad, uh, committee, abroad community forum. And we, we also have an interinstitutional task force for returning Mexicans, uh, different um, uh, branches of the Mexican government uh, are included here so they can provide help uh, to returning Mexicans when it comes uh, to health, uh, um, education, labor, uh, and development, among others. Uh, we're talking about diaspora. So during the pandemics, obviously, um, the there was a record number of remittances of, to Mexico um, 
27%, more or less. And as we said, the diaspora in France organize with some psychologists, uh, some psychologists uh, support for students and uh, women. And they will provide with um, health assistance during the pandemic. And uh, that will be all as I just run short of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for those inspiring words, Mr. Gutierrez Reyes. It's clear that Mexico is doing very much to leverage social capital for its diaspora abroad. Next, Ms. Melek Plutkonak will share her insights based on her experience as the founder of the Turkish Women's International Network, Turkish Win. For over a decade, Turkish Win has gathered open-minded and open-hearted women with cultural, professional, and family ties to Turkey to build a legacy in supporting the next generation of Turkish women. Ms. Polutkonak, you have the floor for the next 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liesl. Um, and as I'm going to share uh, this presentation, I believe we are here at the Diaspora family. Um, and uh, as you listen to my presentation, I would like you to think that, um, to remember that I am a Turkish citizen, a U.S. citizen, a dual citizen, and all the work that I've done is a, a social entrepreneur's doing. And as we are a family here, I would like to introduce you to my family. Meet my aunt Asuman. Uh, she migrated to the United States in the 50s. Her reason for leaving uh, Turkey is quite unique, to divorce her husband. In Turkey at the time, you couldn't divorce your husband without him granting access or agreeing to it. So she thought outside the box and thought, if I get married in a different country, he will surely divorce me. And as luck turns out, there was a, a Turkish American from New York looking for a bride and didn't mind that she was already married. So she moved to New York without speaking a word of English and took a chance, got married to get a divorce in Istanbul. But her husband didn't agree to the divorce for eight long years. So uh, her, story, her story started. The United States gave my aunt Alsaman more freedom for starters to build a successful business. She's still working at the age of 87 and now has built as an entrepreneur a net worth north of $100 million. She also exercised her freedom to divorce uh, more freely. So uh, she had divorced her fourth husband uh, at the age of 44 and has been single since. My family from her side lives uh, in different parts of the United States. And as it happens, the third generation doesn't speak uh, a word of Turkish. I was born in Istanbul on, on our side of the family and knew of my hand, aunt, but didn't have a lot of interaction until I decided to move to the United States. So my parents told me that I should invest in my education. So I tried to do my best on that front. Uh, I got my MBA from Columbia Business School and undergrad from London School of Economics. And I came to New York, this time not uh, for this reason to flee the country like my aunt. Uh, I came with choices. Um, so to start a career at the New York Stock Exchange. I had other challenges than my aunt faced. So I had a college degree, was looking for role models, women who would inspire me. So uh, my aunt and my mom kept on saying, if we did it, so can you. And you better do much better because now you have more money, more education, more of everything. I don't know if it's familiar, sounds familiar to any one of you. In the U.S., I was seeking uh, networks uh, to learn from. You know, I was looking for a career advice. So I went to Turkish American networks, Columbia Business School networks, finance networks, you name it, until I found the TED conferences, a place where people share the same values and a shared connection and a purpose to help ideas worth spreading. I didn't feel at home. And I felt very much uh, not 100% Turkish anymore, not 100% American, planted in a place and floating. Inspired by the TED conferences and by that playbook, I found the Turkish Women's International Network in 2010 in New York City to connect with women like me. We said we will network for change, and as Liesl put it, it's a global sisterhood 
uh, for open-hearted and open-minded women, but cultural family and professional ties to Turkey. And we are very inclusive, not only uh, to Turkish women, but Liz could have been a member of our organization when she was living in Turkey. So it's about the connection uh, to the homeland. And uh, we meet together uh, from 10 different countries. We're about 600 women. And our, we have a combined um, uh, network. And we help each other through different programs. But we also want to give back together. So we want to build a legacy in supporting the next generation of Turkish women. Our programs are uh, fourfold mentoring. Um, and I will show you just to give you an idea of how the network works. In mentoring, you go to a digital platform, pick a mentor and apply from any country. Uh, there's a digital place for events and networking so that we can learn from each other. We have created a speaker club to share our experiences um, and our goods and bads and uglies to inspire and support other women. And then we said it's great to be together, but what else can we do? How can we amplify um, this uh, sense of inclusion um, and how can we have more women participate in the labor force? So then we pulled together facts that I would like to share it because we created a framework. We hope it's going to be helpful for you. For Turkey or any country to realize her potential as a country, we need to mobilize and optimize the natural resources and women and youth. And World Economic Forum agrees and seconds this opinion. The growth is going to come by including these, um, these agents. So we said, okay, then we need to target our efforts to help women build the careers they love so they can participate in the workforce to give you a flavor of that. In Turkey, the labor force participation is around 30%. So um, that is um, half of OECD's average. And if we increase the participation to 60%, the GDP will increase by 20%. So uh, this is so necessary. The second bit, uh, jobs are changing. Um, the new jobs are becoming different and a country's natural assets are its people. And the best people go to where their talent is unlocked the most. And it may not be in Turkey. Uh, so we said, okay, then we can create give back recipes for the diaspora to support for this cause. Um, and we can provide them options to give back when they want it, what they want it. And in Kingsley Stars, everyone is game for a brain exchange. Then we said, how are we going to do that? Uh, so people learn from each other and find the jobs they love. It's about learning. And the future of learning, we are very much influenced by the theory of connectivism, is about being social, connected, and it's distributed. Uh, you cannot be at the center of this if you want to have a scalable model. So we built social networks where people can share career tips, exchange, and a network with experts not it could come from anywhere, and we are including our diaspora along with women of Turkey. And then uh, we know that uh, you can do so much with programs. We need platforms to scale impact beyond advocacy. Uh, to communicate ideas, we need to create a place for weak ties to network, uh, people to find each other um, in an open environment. So with these four pillars, uh, we created give back platforms uh, for Turkish winners as a community to learn from each other. And we said, we're going to work with you. We'll empower them and create solutions with them. We're going to win in digital and we're going to win together. And a Turkish win, uh, it's all about social and intellectual capital for us. Uh, we created this English speaking platform where we can include Liesl or anybody with an interest uh, in Turkey. And uh, we have 600 uh, members. It's a paid membership model. And it's, it's for women only, where we bond and learn from each other in 2010. In 2012, we got the youth uh, going. And we said, if you see something, say something. Be the change. Work with us if you want to have a gender equal future. So we have uh, 60 young uh, female university students in our innovation lab working with us. Uh, then we want to uh, build... Um, uh, what a platform, B Opera, which is uh, launched in 2015. It's Turkish, it's open, it's free, it's inclusive uh, for men and women, anybody to join. Now it has about 20,000 members. This is where we bridge our social capital. And we are linking social capital uh, from the day, first day onwards for projects that matter. Um, I will show you uh, how Being Up Rock works. So this is a place uh, where we share uh, role model videos. 
uh, career tips and blogs uh, with our youth working shoulder to shoulder with us. Um, and we have 20,000 members and reached 5 million people digitally. This is how it works. It, this is um, a digital platform and we cluster groups around topics, uh, what we know about. It could be pharma, law, global careers in UK, Erasmus. Uh, from 18 to 35 for this age group, uh, the Turkish wing group um, uh, gets experts. We look at who knows what in Europe, uh, for instance, for law, US, uh, Asia, and Turkey. And these women get together to create a curriculum of social learning and working with the youth, we deliver it to a lot more people. So how do we link the, uh, uh, the social capital? I'll sh uh, share with you two examples, and you can find a lot more at turkishmin.com. In 2011, we introduced Maya to Kiva's first, uh, to be Kiva's lo first local partner in Turkey. And um, uh, through that connection, $1.2 million in funding was given uh, in microcredit loans to women, uh, to 3,000 women in Turkey. How did this happen? I happened to bump into Kiva's founder at a TED conference, looked up if there's a connection in Turkey, and then put the two together and spent a year mirroring uh, the program. I will share a second example. Meet Umran Baba. She was the GM of PepsiCo in different countries, including Asia um, and Europe. Then she moved to a DNI role in, uh, in the United States and met with an NGO, STEM Connector, in the United States and rolled out a STEM program for women in curls called Million Women Mentors. Our paths crossed and she wanted to bring the program to Turkey. We said, let's do it. This time we were operational partner along with our youth uh, group uh, with U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a local uh, agency. Now we have about... 120 companies committing to this program. It's one year old. The goal is to have 1 million mentoring connections for women and girls in STEM in the age of 15 to 25. And with this uh, platform, there is a chance now to have uh, to pick your mentor. You see the same methodology applies as in Turkish men. Uh, young girls can go to teams and they pick a mentor from overseas or in Turkey. Uh, so that Shebnam in Berkeley, uh, an energy expert, could have a, a mentee, a Zeynep, uh, in Turkey. And uh, we do this in partnership with a lot of different uh, corporate members, uh, along with uh, our uh, individual members. Uh, this is all bootstrapped. We didn't receive any public funding. Um, and what are the lessons learned for us? Uh, we don't otherize. We don't say these are the women in diaspora and these are the women in Turkey. We come together around our passion for our subject, um, the gender equal future, along with um, our passion for our uh, profession, law, pharma, technology, social business. We build digital networks to facilitate big connection. We harvest stories and use storytelling for people to network. We make everyone a stakeholder. Our youth are part of the solution uh, as they are also our um, audience. We empower choice, connection, and progress. This is very important. Uh, let change makers choose when and how they want to contribute by building flexibility to the system. And we fill up, we fill up all the ideas uh, with young people along with amazing programs from overseas. Well, um, I will go to that in a minute, uh, but I will show you how my aunt looks like today with my mom. Uh, and uh, she is uh, running strong and working and continuing her path. And much like my aunt, we hope you agree that Turkish men have built a record of impact that allows us to make our own choices on diaspora is diversity, inclusion, and belonging. In a world where diasporas are communities of purpose for such movements, now it's our time to achieve our vision of scale in partnership with you. At Turkish Men, we are building what you hopefully agree is a good solution on diaspora engagement for these movements. It can be applied to uh, all involved in this journey, private sector, foundation, governments, universities, and others. And we know we must keep innovating and improving too, uh, but our commitment to entrepreneurship and independence, just like my aunt, allows us to do that. Uh, as for Turkish Men, we are now working to adding AI capabilities with SDG AI Labs, a UNDP initiative, and Solvoyo, a tech company by Turkish Americans, to make our platform smarter to achieve the DNI agenda at scale. We are looking to replicate our platform and tools for different countries. And as for me, my aunt uh, made her mark by making $100 million. 
I would like to reach 100 million uh, men and women to build a gender equal future. And as for you, my fellow change maker, if we did this in Turkey, so can you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Palut Konak. What an inspirational keynote, really. And I'm going to sign up right now for Turkish Win. Thank you so much. Next, we will learn from the remarks shared by Ms. Nadira Abdulloyeva, who is a lawyer and human rights activist from Tajikistan and a member of the public organization Human Rights Center. Ms. Abdulloyeva has implemented numerous projects to protect migrant workers in Central Asia. Ms. Abdulayeva, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, dear colleagues, uh, Bienvenue, mes chers collègues, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici. To everyone. Um, in this presentation, I would Dans like cette présentation, j'aimerais contribuer, contribuer à l'importance du cadre juridique qui encadre les applications de la diaspora. I have to uh, switch the Il faut que je mette en ordre translation. Ma présentation. In this presentation, I would like to concentrate on the importance of legal frameworks l'importance du cadre juridique, particularly when it comes to understanding national identities and how they are reflected in normative and policy frameworks, en particulier and, uh, dans les cadres politiques of diaspora individuals et des individus au centre de la diaspora. Le son de l'intervenant est malheureusement très mauvais et l'interprète fera ce qu'elle peut pour le Les migrants retiennent les liens culturels et économiques dans plus d'un pays. L'impact de ces identités transnationales doit être tenu en compte pour les cadres normatifs et les politiques mises en place. La protection et la promotion des droits des individus qui appartiennent à la communauté de la diaspora doivent refléter leurs affiliations multiples ainsi que leur identité propre au centre de la diaspora pour leurs droits et leur sécurité sociale. Bien entendu, en tenant compte du pays d'origine et de la définition de leur cadre législatif individuel, il est important de savoir également can hamper effective diaspora engagement policies. To que la diaspora s'engage de façon définitive pour les individus. L'OIM se prépare à redéfinir un cadre du juridique with a particular focus on avec une, un focus particulier sur les formules régulatoires qui concernent les communautés et les diasporas. Je vais euh, souligner euh, que vous avez vraiment... Nous ne pouvons pas voir votre écran ah, okay. et nous vous entendons assez mal. Is it okay? Désolé de vous interrompre. Il faut... Désolé de vous avoir interrompu. Oops. Just a minute. Un instant. Is it good? C'est bien comme ça? Voilà, parfait. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. uh, first, it's essential to mention some fundamental documents. Donc, je veux parler de quelques documents essentiels pour la gouvernance de la migration et des conditions des migrants et de la diaspora. L'agenda 230 a souligné le rôle positif de la migration qui doit faciliter la migration responsable, sécurisée et dans le bon ordre pour correspondre à l'ODD 19. L'objectif 19 a souligné plusieurs priorités parmi lesquelles subsiste des contributions pour les immigrants dans les capacités institutionnelles et de leur intégration dans des plans de développement à un niveau local, régional et international pour aider, créer des bureaux nationaux 
Dans le cadre des missions diplomatiques ou consulaires, pour aider la participation et les contributions non financières des migrants dans la diaspora, pour aider au processus d'intégration. D'autres priorités ont également mentionné dans cet objectif 19, le paragraphe 35 We started to work on the report by analyzing, analyzing the various legal and policy definitions attributed to diaspora within the international, regional, and national frameworks. As you know, there is no legal definition of the diaspora in international law. And we reviewed academic literature and other documentation. And uh, it's worth to mention that in uh, studies, the definition of uh, diaspora even elaborated, it's still debated. If we summarize existing definitions elaborated by scholars, one can determine several common denominators. An integral characteristics of the diaspora is that the place of its residence is established in a country different from the country of origin. Therefore, diaspora communities are transnationally embedded at least at two locations. Second, diaspora build and support links between countries of origin and destination. It's important also to mention that uh, in international level, the, the, the definition of diaspora, which elaborated by IOM, is widely used. This definition developed in, uh, was firstly developed in 24 and then elaborated and has evolved in its current definition. Migrants or dissidents of migrants whose identity and migration experience and background have shaped a sense of belonging. Using this term interchangeably allows for a more comprehensive approach and facilitates information and data collection. IOM refers to the diaspora as transnational communities because in a world of unprecedented global mobility, they compromise people who are connected to more than one country. The transnational nature of diaspora implies that these people are crucial when it comes to connecting countries and communities, because they can call on multiple networks, relate to different identities and share a sense of belonging to more than one community. We also review the term of diaspora at the regional level. And for instance, African Union has elaborated its own definition. And this definition uh, considers the continent's needs and characteristics. The European Commission Migration Home Affairs used the definition which was developed by IOM. And also we reviewed the definitions of uh, the definition of diaspora, which uh, elaborated by different intergovernmental and regional financial institutions. And they also elaborated these definitions based on their program and project uh, aims. For instance, OECD definition of diaspora also consider child rights perspective. And we also looked at the definition of diaspora at the national legislation. And if we can uh, look at this uh, slide, then in Asia, the ter term of diaspora is rarely used. And instead, it, uh, they, many Asian governments use two main characteristics assigned to diaspora. First, previous ties to a homeland or a state of ethnicity. And second, the engagement of diaspora members in the country's development. Africa, several countries of Africa already established the definition of diaspora, for instance, uh, Rwanda, Ghana, and other states use different terminology, um, mainly citizens abroad. And uh, in general, most of the countries here, they follow the definition which established in uh, African Union. Uh, the term of diaspora in America is used in some countries and it's similar in some countries to IOM definitions. However, most of the states refer to nationals living abroad. Europe, in Europe, some countries use the term of diaspora, for instance, Ireland. And in many countries, there is different terms that is used. 
for instance, uh, citizens abroad compatriots, persons residing abroad, former compatriots. And uh, in some countries of Europe, there is already laws on diaspora, like in Latvia and Serbia. Even if different terms are used, where there are also common denominators. Usually the, the diaspora members are recognized as those who live abroad temporarily or permanently, maintaining the connection with the country of origin in different way. In Asia and America, definitions also specifically emphasize on the role of the diaspora in developing the country of origin. Thus, some jurisdictions have broader uh, definitions and already reflect the aspects of transnational identity of diaspora members and other jurisdictions use narrow terms where transnational identity and legal rights are not yet reflected. From the perspective of regional cooperation and legal perspective, the lack of consistent definition may lead to the development of non-coherent policies. In practice, it may affect the comprehensive enjoyment of rights or restrictions of rights of diaspora members on countries of origin and destination. Uh, and uh, here I want to uh, say some words about our uh, research. The following st steps we are planning for the research uh, to analyze the scopes of rights, political, social, and economic rights provided to individuals from the diaspora in their countries of origin, explicitly examining legal identity, documentations, and rights evolving from them. To analyze the good practices for diaspora engagement codified in national legal frameworks and uh, give due consideration to the transnational identity and diaspora communities. Uh, the study will be a comparative, comparative legal analysis of selected jurisdictions. Five countries of origin and two countries of destination will be selected, and we will review laws, policies, official studies, official statements and studies. And uh, for the selection of the countries, we set up the following criteria. First, evolving policies that take into consideration the transnational identity. Second, policies, laws that consider the legal identity of diaspora and develop policy from the rights perspective. And uh, the law and policy take into consideration gender mainstreaming and also data availability and language accessibility will be an additional criteria. We hope that this study will enhance understanding on the transnational links, identities of uh, diaspora communities and will provide a more nuanced understanding for the development of laws and policies that would take into consideration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you again so much, Ms. Abdullaeva. I'm so sorry for the, the, in, the interruption of your great presentation. <clears throat> we just wanted to make sure we could see your, your full screen because the words really matter. There's some really interesting things you're doing in that, in that research. Well, audience, now it's time to turn to questions. Uh, I hope that you'll make good use of the chat box. And uh, I've put a couple of starter questions out there to pique your interest. Um, but please feel free to address your questions to any of the speakers. You know, in the session so far, we've gone for, we've traveled from the Americas to Anatolia, to Central Asia, and to explore this idea of diversity, inclusion, and belonging among diasporas. And I think themes that I heard across the sessions, I think first and foremost, you know, even just starting with the last presentation, words and definitions matter. The actual words and definitions of who is the diaspora um, and what it means to be peoplehood, whether that's diaspora, country of origin, um, or this greater collective, these words matter because they define who's in and who's out. They truly shape the contours, I think, of collective action. So we need to be, I think, very careful how we put these words on paper, whether it be in a law, whether it be in any kind of research paper or any kind of platform. We have to think very, very carefully about, uh, about that um, if we're trying to strive for diversity, inclusion, and belonging. We've also heard from different structural forms of creating diaspora inclusion um, and belonging and diversity from government, as well as private sector, as well as our citizen sector. These web of networks across sectors are really very critical, both in terms of countries of origin, residents, and most importantly, I think, transnationally, holistically, collectively. 
The role of technology here is key. This cre this transnational out of time and space really sense of belonging um, that Turkish wind, for example, creates could not be done as easily without really advanced platforms and technology. And the work that the government of Mexico, for example, has been putting into place could not be done without the role of that as well. And I love Turkish Wind's phrase, give the diaspora, give back recipes. You know, so that we're not all recreating the wheel that we can readily plug in um, that political, social, economic capital into where it's most and readily needed. I love the idea of these, these recipes. So now let's turn to see what we might have in the chats. See if we have any questions that have uh, come out. Oh, of course, Martin Russell is our first question. I I would not uh, be I was not surprised to see his question uh, here in the chat box first. So he says he has a question for all of the speakers. It seems clear that issues of diversity, inclusion, and belonging is emerging as a frame of consideration that can increase its visibility in the foundation and private sector spaces. Also, as many major organizations in those sectors address these issues. Do our speakers have any reflections on how we can increase the visibility of diaspora engagement in those areas? How could it be linked to being more flexible in our definition? Any responses from our three speakers on, on uh, Mr. Russell's question? Um, I can uh, I can give um, my piece of uh, thoughts. Well, what I uh, find uh, with these global organizations, for instance, I'll give the example of Pepsi, uh, Pepsi uh, and Company. Um, for instance, Pepsi uh, is running a, a program across different um, countries. And Pepsi uh, is a global organization, also has a lot of different diasporas. Uh, you know, uh, I used to work for Microsoft as a deputy GM, and then you have 100,000 people working in different countries. Uh, so you have Africans, you have Turks, you have uh, Germans, etc., in different uh, uh, countries. So what I find, for instance, at Pepsi's work um, is... Um, a way for people to get to know each other around their passion areas. Uh, for instance, it's not only diaspora. I think diaspora uh, is the recipient, but I think the SDG causes are the vehicles. So in terms of putting this framework of inclusion, um, the company is trying to create a psychological safe space for employees where they can show what they want, what they're passionate about, and they can express themselves. So if I can express myself around my ethnicity and what I would like to do and how I would like to give back, and uh, it, it, my ethnicity is not sufficient, so it's, it's a cause for education. Um, it's a cause for gender equality. It's a cause for something else. So the inclusion part um, drives people to identify what they would like and the vehicles that the, uh, the companies provide whether it's rolling out million women mentors program in different uh, countries um, so that they can also connect the people, um, uh, the Turks working anywhere else in PepsiCo uh, is a way to go. Uh, as long as companies um, have real psychological safety and uh, real vehicles uh, so that you can connect these different programs, it's again about recipes. Uh, an employee cannot come up with something unless uh, he or she is a CEO to roll something out. Um, if there are programs where she can propose um, uh, uh, a, a program to be adopted, uh, that's when the, the framework um, is deployed. Any other comments on that particular question for the, from, uh, from the floor? All right, while we're waiting for additional questions from uh, our audience, uh, Mr. Gutierrez, I wanted to ask you a question. Please go ahead. Um, since I'm here <laughs> in, uh, in the United States and, uh, and the, the work that, that I have read about the Mexican diaspora and, uh, and the great diaspora here in this, in this country, 
So much of what I have read um, revolves around the great work of hometown associations. Could you speak a little bit about what the government has been doing with your web of networks to try to link um, across those hometown associations to sort of raise the, the collective consciousness and collective action of the Mexican diaspora at sort of higher levels of analysis and engagement? Mm -hmm. So right now we are, we are working in building the small networks uh, around our consulates. For example, uh, in this uh, from the sexual diversity, we are looking for organization from the so, the, so, the social the civil social society, also from. Uh, college, universities, or researchers that working in in in, in, the, in the defense of the rights of these people. So yeah, and so, well, the consulates are organized and uh, organize these uh, special meetings to share uh, experience about the problems we have in 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 the city. So we found this small network, and right now. We are building this small networks in all the consulates. Next step is to, uh, to arrange a, 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 a meeting with all these small networks to launch the big national network in, in terms of the uh, diversity, or in terms of the helping uh, nat native Mexicans, migrants. And that, this is the next step we will have this year. Recording in progress. Uh, and camaraderie and belongingness in diaspora, but also as sort of a, um, an agent of change as a group. Thank you. I had some technical uh, technical problems. Can you please can you please uh, repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm wondering if no problem. I'm wondering if you could tell us a story of how you worked with migrant individuals in small networks to raise their awareness that they were part of a larger group uh -huh. to mobilize them for collective action. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. And um, of course, here, um, if um, you are, if, uh, am I correctly understood, you are referred to my personal experience. Am I mm -hmm. correct? Yes, yeah, and I, I came from um, like sub region Central Asia where migration and uh, it's like, um, uh, like migration is only in, in, in it's developing and it's uh, corridors, you know, it's also developing. And the issue, uh, the issue of uh, engagement of, of migrants is kind of sensitive in our part of the world uh, because uh, in many cases, uh, migrants from Central Asia, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, they are, um, when they migrate to another country and they try to hold these links with this country of origin, uh, it's uh, mostly uh, links to the political rights and because of the political system of countries of Central Asia it's become sensitive and from this 
from this uh, perspective, the uh, migrants face a lot of problems, and maybe you have heard a lot of uh, European um, courts, uh, human human rights courts uh, practice when migrants they are in, engaged with political rights and try to affect the po political situation in countries of their origin, and then uh, they are uh, like investigated in, uh, under the tra trouble with between the, these two countries, like Russia and Tajikistan, Russia and Kyrgyzstan, etc. So from this perspective, from my personal experience, this issue are evolving and this issue that there is no like clear, uh, you know, understanding of how we can uh, engage with migrants. Of course, there is some initiatives. They try to engage migrants uh, to the economy, but in order to engage them to the economy, the, the, the countries, they need a, a right political system. Migrants need to be, you know, uh, willingness. They need to have willingness to contribute to the countries of their uh, origin. So it's a quite complicated issue, but thank you that you ask this question. And I think someday we can also uh, bring this lens to the subregions, like where migration is like a kind of evolving issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I see Ms. Palukonak, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yes, um, you had asked uh, what are the ways in which diaspora engagement can contribute to diversity, equity, inclusion in SDGs. Um, so uh, I want to get going on that front. Um, uh, well, um, if if I'm passionate, uh, if I'm a business leader um, or an NGO leader, if I'm passionate about gender equity um, um, or climate change or any other SDG, I have an experience in the country where I am. Uh, I may be, you know, a, a Turkish person living in the U.S., Germany, or somewhere else, and my experience is different. Uh, then uh, solving that problem in Turkey. But that even brings diversity of solutions, diversity of opinions, diversity of experiences. Um, so um, if the governments or policymakers are pulling uh, diaspora around certain SDG challenges, um, so it's very focused networking as opposed to um, a general uh, question and uh, very quickly, you find the people who are mad about this problem and who are doing so much about it. So it doesn't take a very long time in each country to find the academic, the NGO leader, business leader who is passionate and is in the trenches of solving these problems. And um, if uh, we network uh, on such uh, uh, defined subjects, uh, then we can harvest uh, the people and their knowledge uh, from the diaspora. And um, if I'm passionate in it, if I live and breathe for it in my, uh, wherever I am, I'm so happy to do the brain exchange. Um, so I would really encourage for all of the SDGs to have different task forces and, and to map out the networks and to, to bring these people together because they will also love to meet each other. Um, um, not only about their ethnicity, but also around what they live uh, for, uh, for their sense of purpose. Uh, so that would be my uh, uh, two cents uh, on that question. Thank you so much. Any other comments uh, from our other panelists about how diasporas could contribute to diversity, inclusion, and belonging related to the SDGs, Global Compact on Migration, and other larger global initiatives. Any other comments on, on that from our other panelists? Yes, please, Mr. Gutierrez. In, in, la, in, la, in my presentation, I commentaba sobre about this program that we have launched on a consular de emprendimiento para mujeres in conjunto con the University of Arizona. Y, 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 y inicialmente eh, buscábamos eh, empoderar y apoyar, sobre todo en independencia financiera, a mujeres migrantes, madres solteras, mujeres víctimas de violencia eh, intrafamiliar, de los sectores más desprotegidos de la migración mexicana, sobre todo de, de, de los indocumentados en, 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 en Arizona. A partir de ahí hemos ido convocando a diferentes con, este, comunidades en, en, en los Estados Unidos eh, pero de repente eh, empezamos a, vis a, a visibilizar problemas semejantes en otros lados del mundo como en Europa 
de mujeres mexicanas que emigraron eh, casadas con, con nacionales de diferentes países y que por la visa que tienen de, de, de esposas no pueden trabajar y enfrentamos muchos problemas de violencia, sobre todo cuando ya tienen hijos, que los hijos son nacionales europeos, las mujeres no pueden regresar a México porque no, no pueden viajar con los hijos y no pueden trabajar. Entonces hemos estado desarrollando precisamente estas herramientas también para ayudarles a, a poder independizarse, a tener una autosuficiencia financiera y poder permanecer en el país donde residen los hijos y dejar de depender ¿no? de, 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 del macho violento. Y, y este, entonces hemos ido identificando diferentes necesidades de las diásporas en, mexicanas en el mundo que a final de cuentas tienen cuestiones transversales y que, y que coinciden en los temas de la violencia, en los, tema, en los temas de la dependencia y en los temas de la necesidad del empoderamiento de mujeres en cualquier parte del mundo donde se encuentren. Y por ello vamos a lanzar eh, en, en el verano ya una convocatoria global para este programa de emprendimiento y la Universidad de Arizona y otras organizaciones eh, nos están apoyando. Pero ahí, por ejemplo, también hemos logrado la, el involucramiento de, de la diáspora calificada en muchas de las, de las instituciones consulares, sobre todo de México en Estados Unidos, tenemos el apoyo de eh, empresarios, mexicanos, migrantes, de las organizaciones como Cámaras de Comercio Hispano, Hispanas en los Estados Unidos, las cuales se están acercando para fortalecer este programa y nos empiezan a donar computadoras, empiezan a ofrecer microcréditos. Entonces creemos que este va a ser un programa con mucho potencial para apoyar a la, a la mujer migrante en todo el mundo. Gracias. Thank you very much uh, for that comment. Yes, I think in, uh, you all have given excellent examples of how diaspora communities, diaspora leaders, and governments can create structures, processes, and goals, really, that, that create more of a sense of identity and belonging within the diaspora. We have a great question here, though, in the, in the, uh, in the chat box um, around What do you consider needs to be done from the diaspora's perspective to basically have diasporas advocate for a greater sense of belonging, inclusion within countries of residence among the, the, the diaspora itself, but also within their country of residence? So how can diasporas work to create and advocate for more inclusion of their own within countries of residence? Um, I will go uh, with uh, a philosophy. Uh, you are, you are um, included or you're in the conversation if you are relevant, if you have something to say. Um, um, so, uh, we have to say, uh, we have to be able to relevant and have something to say as a diaspora people, um, uh, in the country and, uh, find relevant places. Um, so it's again, uh, for instance, um, if you are passionate about technology, being in technology circles, and uh, being relevant to the conversation there. Just showing up and uh, being who you are is not relevant anymore. We have to be relevant and strategic uh, with uh, the ways we represent uh, our country. Um, because, it, you know, me being Turkish doesn't matter. Uh, me being a Turkish social entrepreneur in a social entrepreneurship circles matters. And I am... Uh, representing uh, something that is relevant uh, and that's part of the conversation. Uh, so uh, we have to be relevant and strategic in our communication, uh, wherever we are. Um, and we have to uh, engage the youth, uh, which has a lot more in common, you know, for the older people. Uh, and I think we, until Generation Z, we, we have a tough time. It's, I think, very difficult for us. Or for the Z generation and onwards, it's going to be very different. They are coming very inclusive anyhow. So this is uh, 20, 30 years we're going to pass. We're going to wait it out. Then it's going to, everything is going to solve themselves because they come wired differently. 
Thank God. Uh, so until, you know, uh, this, uh, and Generation Z comes to power, they come very inclusive uh, and they don't otherize um, the way our generations do. Uh, we are going to keep the gates open, do the work um, and be relevant. Thank you. Any other comments from panelists on that? Yes, Mr. Gutierrez, please. Pues este, también toca eh, identificar problemas en, en comunes y, y, y afrontarlos en, en, este, en la perspectiva de la participación de todos. Por ejemplo, en los Estados Unidos no podemos hablar solamente de la migración mexicana. Tenemos que hablar de la de una vez ya residiendo en los Estados Unidos, dejan de ser mexicanos y forman parte de la comunidad hispana de ese país. Aunque los mexicanos constituyen el 73% de la comunidad hispana de los Estados Unidos, si no enfrentamos el problema en conjunto con los gobiernos, por ejemplo, de Honduras, El Salvador y Guatemala, cuando las problemáticas en, de la gente en los Estados Unidos son semejantes, pues no vamos a avanzar mucho, no vamos a tener la capacidad de diálogo con las autoridades locales. Un ejemplo de esto durante la, durante la pandemia en que teníamos la, este, la preocupación de cómo íbamos a acceder a las vacunas para nuestros migrantes fue precisamente el acercamiento con autoridades locales que nos abrió el, el, paz, el espacio para poder llegar a, a, a tener vacunas, pero a cambio los consulados de México abrieron sus puertas para que cualquier persona de cualquier nacionalidad pudiera tener acceso a la vacuna en nuestros consulados. Entonces tuvimos un flujo constante de centroamericanos, latinoamericanos y de, de otras nacionalidades. Entonces la, la integración comunitaria de, de, de los hispanos a, a, a nivel transversal y atendiendo toda la problemática en conjunto, pues da mayor poder a la voz y da mayor este, interlocución con las autoridades. ¿no? Entonces creo que es un paso que tenemos que seguir fortaleciendo en conjunto con toda la región en el caso nuestro. Well, beautifully said, beautifully said, hand in hand. Any other comments on this before we turn to the next question? Uh, Ms. Abdulayeva, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, just to maybe uh, continue the con conversation and what already um, Malik mentioned, that uh, it's maybe simple, but it's important that from the legal perspective, in order for uh, providing the ground for the aspira to engage you know, with the locals. We need this uh, uh, legal framework. We need right definitions and definitions. We need to uh, consider how to, uh, you know, elaborate these definitions to uh, address all these needs and transnational um, identities and rights of migrants uh, in countries of origin and destination. So it's simple, but it's the first step. And I just wanted to note it again. Thank you. Well, we're coming close to the close, but I wanted to, you know, we have had such a great fortune to, to learn from you as leaders in this movement. And I'm wondering if you could give us a two minute sort of summary of recommendations that you have for diaspora leaders, particularly those of the younger generation. What recommendations, what experiences what skills do you think the next generation of diaspora leaders need to successfully make progress on the goals we're talking about today? Diversity, inclusion, and belongingness. Ms. Abdulayeva, since you're on screen, would you like to go first? Can I have a bit time to, to reflect on the question? Sure. Anybody else ready to give a recommendation? I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I have well, a feeling you were. Go ahead, Mel. Well, I think the next generation is ready. Uh, it's their time. Uh, we just need to set the, the foundations for them. Uh, they have the skills, they have the right attitude, they are inclusive. It's us not including the young people, next generation, in the solution set. Uh, they are usually in the problems that the way we have approach, uh, you know, uh, the, the diaspora question or the frameworks. So I really think they have the skills, they have the platforms, um, and they know how to be inclusive. 
Um, and we have to set the foundations and make sure we don't leave too much of a baggage for them to clean up. Uh, so we have to clean up after ourselves and give them a clean slate. I think this is what we can do. Uh, I fully trust them. Um, I know they know how to communicate. Uh, it's going to be a different era of connectivity. Um, and um, they will bring this uh, global community as to feeling uh, the community of one. Um, so I'm very confident about that. So it, the way we have run this is we are trying to be act like them <laughs> and work with them, act like them and be inclusive. Um, be inclusive and listen and include anybody who wants to give um, an idea, uh, resources or ways uh, of uh, doing things in a more networked way. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, please, Mr. Gutierrez. Pleasure. <clears throat> Precisamente nosotros estamos este, trabajando con, con, con los jóvenes de la, de la diáspora, aprendiendo de ellos, sobre todo son ya generaciones que crecieron en otros países como en Canadá y en Estados Unidos, y, y a, a, estamos este, promoviendo la, la generación de los futuros líderes binacionales, y tenemos este, precisamente dos programas, uno de ellos son los, los foros que realizamos con jóvenes beneficiarios de DACA, los jóvenes Dreamers en los Estados Unidos, Tuvimos uno en Washington en noviembre del año pasado, donde convocamos a jóvenes de 30 estados. La meta este año es convocar a jóvenes de todos los estados y que, que este, a, a tener un foro en México eh, para intercambiar y para que conozcan directamente desde el gobierno lo que está haciendo y cómo interactuar en conjunto, porque también buscamos su participación política en México y en Estados Unidos. La, la, la manera de poder generar una política binacional y un, y un impacto en políticas públicas de ambos lados de la frontera es que las comunidades se reconozcan que son de los dos lados. O sea, no son de un país o de otro, son de los dos países y tenemos que trabajar con los gobiernos de ambos países para reconocer esta, esta binacionalidad. También estamos trabajando con jóvenes eh, este, migrantes o, o, o ya jóvenes de segunda generación para que vengan a México, conozcan el país, no pierdan las raíces, no pierdan el vínculo y eh, este, no solo se encuentren con la cultura de sus padres, sus abuelos, también que se encuentren con el idioma materno de sus familias y nos hemos encontrado que regresan a Estados Unidos o regresan a Canadá y este, se involucran en política local, se empiezan a postular, van a ser concejales, este, empiezan a participar en, 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 en políticas educativas y, y, y con eso vamos a ir construyendo una, un diálogo y una, y una cultura política binacional. Y, y son ellos los que nos están enseñando el camino, ¿no? Los jóvenes. Y, y, y el otro paso para los que no están este, siendo atendidos en esos programas es el hecho de trabajar para el acceso a educación superior. Tenemos que provocar que las nuevas generaciones de la diáspora salgan de los servicios, de los trabajos mal pagados, y eso seguramente lo lograremos con educación, con acceso a educación superior, y pues trabajamos en programas de becas y, y, este, y en empoderamiento a nivel global. Gracias. Thank you. Any other comments about the next generation of leaders in diaspora and what they need? One of our uh, commenters in the chat box uh, had an interesting observation mentioning how difficult it is to do the work of diaspora, being inclusive, being and creating a sense of belonging when so many diaspora workers um, that are forging ahead and advocating for this are doing so unpaid while they actually have other day jobs and life and, and family responsibilities. Um, and I think it's very important to recognize that a lot of the very hard work that is done in this space is done out of true passion on that extra fuel. I always, uh, Martin Russell and I were talking this morning about how the diaspora never sleeps. And in large part, that is because of their deep, very deep passion to make and build a different world uh, for their children and for the next generation. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the close of this very captivating session. I want to give my deep thanks to the government of Mexico for supporting this session.
Thank you to Ms. Palutkanak as well for your inspiring keynote address and Ms. Abdulayeva for your insightful remarks. Most of all, thanks to our thoughtful audience for sharing your experiences and insights. May all of the sessions in this conference be as good as this one. I think our main takeaways here have been, if we want to create belonging in the world, then we need as those advocating for diasporas and within diasporas, we need to be inclusive as well. Bringing the public, citizen and private sector together with multilateral organizations, leveraging technology and really drawing in that Generation Z where hopefully the next generation with our efforts will create a very new world based on greater senses of belonging. Thank you all so much for joining us today.